So our consultant virologist, Dr Chris Smith, joins us now to update us on the developments in fighting the COVID-19. Morning, Chris. Hello, Kim. Let us talk about the race for a vaccine. There have been some positive results, but some people seem to doubt whether we will ever find a vaccine that's efficient against this particular coronavirus. Why is it so hard? I think people are being cautious because you can never say never in medicine. And we have no track record of making vaccines against coronaviruses full stop, let alone making a vaccine against this coronavirus, which is a new kid on the biological block. We've never seen it before. And therefore, we just don't know. They're tough customers, these coronaviruses, for various reasons, and they can do funny things to the immune system. And when people tried to make vaccines against SARS Mark I back in 2002 to 2003, they weren't successful. And they weren't successful for a couple of reasons. One of them, that they ended up actually with a vaccine that was capable of making the vaccinees iller than the non-vaccinated individuals. And there was obviously concern that that might happen again this time. That said, there are more than 100 projects going on around the world in different countries, different laboratories taking different approaches. And that's probably going to translate into at least 10 vaccine candidates that all use different ways of trying to do one thing, which is to render a person immune to this virus. The, um, the US biotech firm Moderna has reported antibody levels from its vaccine similar to those found in recovered patients in a very small sample, 25 people. Mm. But at the same time, we are told from the Rockefeller University in New York that most people who recovered from COVID-19 without going to hospital, that is not terribly serious, did not make many killer antibodies against the virus. So if the natural infection uh, doesn't give you that much immunity, except when it's severe, what would a vaccine do is the question. Well, one has to be cautious about how you interpret these things because when they go looking and hunting around for antibodies, you don't know if they're actually looking for the antibodies that they want to detect in their test or the antibodies that an individual has made that work for them. Because when an individual makes an immune response, you will make a, a broad repertoire of antibodies, which will hit the target. And some of them might hit additional bits of the target. And in that person, they work better. But if you don't look for those antibodies, you might conclude this person doesn't have any antibodies or they have a low level of antibodies. Also, it's not a given that just because you've got antibody, that these antibodies work the way you think they work. So a person with really high levels of antibody, that doesn't, that doesn't necessarily translate into and this person is more immune than this person with fewer antibodies. They might have antibodies at lower level, but they're really potent. So at the moment, we, we just don't have the measure of this thing to know what these values really mean or how long these antibodies are going to provide protection for. I suspect that we will get a way of giving long-term protection to people, whether that's through natural infection or whether that's the vaccine. I suspect that protection is going to be relatively long-term. But at the moment, because we've only known about the virus for a matter of months, we just don't know. And the reason you're confident about that, ish, confident-ish, is that this coronavirus seems relatively stable compared, for example, to the influenza. Well, I've, I've got a couple of, of strings to my bow here. One, you quite rightly point out that the virus does not appear to be genetically changing very much. And we've now got heaps of data where people are tracking it around the world and they're reading the genetic code of the coronavirus in samples they recover from patients. And so these are genuine clinical specimens from patients. They're reading the, ge the genome of it and then they're uploading that to a database centrally so we can compare many, many hundreds of genomes collected from many, many hundreds of patients over a number of months. And a very fast evolving virus will very rapidly accrue changes. And, and you'll quite quickly see these changes burgeoning into big outbreaks because they confer some kind of reproductive fitness on the virus. We are not seeing that here. What we're seeing is a virus that's very stable, genetically speaking. It's only changing its, its genome by a couple of genetic letters every month. So there's probably a handful, now maybe 12, 15 changes in the virus circulating now compared to the original ones we documented from Wuhan. And scientists are pretty much in agreement that those changes are not conferring additional virulence or spreadability, if that's a word, on the virus. So we're pretty confident that that's OK. The other thing that buoys me up is that 
we've now begun to see data emerging in very relevant animal models that these vaccines are beginning to work the way that we hope they will. The group from Oxford University have teamed up with researchers in America and they've put the vaccine that's currently undergoing clinical trials in Oxford. It went in initially to a 1,000 people. It's a controlled trial. So what they've done is recruit a 1,000 people and put half of them onto the vaccine arm. They've got the real deal. The other half have got an equivalent vaccine that works against a totally different target. So they're the controls. They're now recruiting about 10,000 people in order to test the effectiveness in all age groups from young children right up to uh, people in their 70s. So this is a a physiologically relevant age range. But in the meantime, they've taken that vaccine with these Americans, they've put this into monkeys and monkeys produce a syndrome very similar to humans when they get infected with this new coronavirus. And when they give the vaccine to monkeys and then challenge them with the infection, they don't prevent infection This is the interesting thing. The monkeys still seem to get the virus and they still seem to have quite a lot of it recoverable from their nose and throat, but they don't get damage to their lungs, unlike control monkeys that have not been vaccinated or have been given a control vaccine, they do get damage to their lungs. So this suggests that at the very worst, because they did give a relatively low dose of their vaccine, it will protect and it will not necessarily prevent infection but it will protect against the most serious consequences that's that's one thing the other major concern that research has had about these vaccines was that when we tried to make SARS vaccines previously there was a phenomenon called antibody dependent enhancement and what that meant is people saw antibodies coming up uh, which didn't switch off the virus but did paradoxically help the virus to infect our cells. So the worry was that in trying to vaccinate people, we may actually make them more susceptible to severe disease. That doesn't seem to be happening in these monkeys, suggesting it probably isn't going to happen in people either. And there are other papers now emerging using different vaccination techniques which are also seeming to produce uh, clinical benefits. So I'm encouraged by that, but obviously there's still a long way to go from initial trials in in monkey models to to proving safety and then efficacy in humans. I mean, we're kind of desperate for a vaccine in New Zealand, of course, because having virtually flattened our curve, we will now be in a bubble in the Pacific. And if everybody else still has it then we're kind of isolated, right? (laughs) It's a very nice bubble to be in, and many people are quite jealous of you right now, but I know exactly what you mean, which is that uh, it's all very well cleaning up our own backyard, but if we don't help everyone else to clean up theirs, then the wind blows the dirt straight back in again, and therefore this is a global problem, needs a global solution. We're all in this together. We've all got to tidy it up together, and no one's safe and no one's happy until everyone's safe and everyone's happy. And that's exactly the situation that many, many countries are now finding themselves in or, or getting towards finding themselves in, and it's a big headache. And yes, we're all pinning enormous hopes on on there being a viable vaccine, but the problem is, at the moment, there's we're in the foothills here, And, uh, you know, when you're climbing a mountain, you can't sometimes see the really, really big peak behind the bump in front of you. And the really, really big peak, the really big headache that's coming isn't necessarily going to be making a vaccine. Actually, the bigger headache is going to be making 8 billion doses of a vaccine to get that either worldwide or at least sufficient doses to protect the millions of people who are most vulnerable to the infection. And that is going to take time because it's not because we're not willing, it's not because there isn't even the resource in terms of money, it's the -the on-the-ground resources. It's getting this into remote places, it's getting it into places that don't have their own manufacturing facilities, and it's getting it in there effectively and safely. And that is potentially an even bigger challenge than making the vaccine in the first place. Let's talk about antibody tests, Chris. They're being rolled out, I think, in the UK to establish if individuals are immune to COVID-19. That's right. If at what stage after infection are antibodies produced and if an antibody test is positive, does it mean that individual is no longer infectious? Antibodies are just part of the immune response that we make. And they take a few weeks to produce 
in high quantities and in particular of one particular class of them called IgG antibodies. And these switch in once you have uh, been infected and you have cleared the virus and their role is to act as partly an early warning defence system and a neutralisation system. They're sticky, they're shaped like the letter Y with the arms outstretched and the ends of those arms, if you held your arms above your head doing YMCA, where the fingers are, those are the sticky bits of the antibody that bind onto things and will neutralise them. And in the case of coronavirus, they're going to bind onto the spike of the virus and deactivate it so it can't get into our cells, we hope. But the other major role that antibodies provide is as, as a sort of molecular flag, because if they're in your bloodstream, it shows that you have been exposed to the agent that those antibodies recognise. And not only have you been exposed, but you've recovered. Therefore, you've got these antibodies and they are going to protect you. We don't know yet how long they're going to protect you for. It could be a very short time. It could be a very long time. We don't know purely because we've only known about the virus for a matter of months. And therefore, the natural experiment, which is asking when someone's had it, how long do they remain protected for, that set of experiments are ongoing. The evidence we have at the moment is that certainly people catch it, they clear it, they make antibodies, and they don't have virus in them anymore, and they make those antibodies within a few weeks, and then you can't infect animals that also have antibodies in this way. So this suggests they are neutralising, they are protective, they are going to be long-lived, but exactly how long-lived, that's the ongoing experiment. But if I prove positive for antibodies... I am no longer infectious. Is that the deal? That's what we believe to be the case, yeah. There have been these claims right. uh, in the past where people tested positive and then, then people said, I think our patients are getting this again. And I think we all agree now that that is not happening. It was probably dodgy tests or dodgy sampling, which was leading to a small number of people suspecting that they were catching this again. They weren't catching it again, most probably. It's just that when they were being sampled the uh, test was returning a false negative because no test is perfect. And so it was leading people to think someone had cleared the virus and then when they tested them again and found it the next time, they concluded they caught it again. I don't think they had. I think those, those antibodies are protective. Is there any evidence, Chris, that hydro, hy, hydroxychloroquine, just channelling President Trump there, hydroxychloroquine is in any way effective against COVID-19? Uh, we only have anecdotal evidence and some weak clinical data. There are a number of reasons why it might have a benefit. And one suggestion is that it affects the way that sugars are added to the coat of cells and to the thing that the virus is recognising. The other suggestion is that it may in some way affect the way that the virus replicates its genetic information in cells. But the effects were noted in the dish in an in vitro situation and they haven't been replicated at any scale in patients. And people are doing clinical trials on this, they're testing this. There hasn't been this resounding, reassuring, this works, we need to be giving patients hydroxychloroquine. So at the moment we don't believe that the effect is sufficiently strong to warrant doing this or uh, also taking into account the side effects of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine they, they Which can are... have they can have consequences for the heart because uh, these these agents can affect the electrical activity in the heart and they're therefore potentially capable of tri triggering rhythm abnormalities in your heart irregular heartbeat and so on not in everybody but uh, no drugs are without side effects and that would be one of the side effects i mean you'd have to do a cost benefit analysis right given the uncertainty surrounding the coronavirus it's possible that President Trump is right, that taking hydroxychloroquine is risking less than catching COVID-19. Well, well, yes, that's true. If, if hydroxychloroquine were shown to have a very profound effect on coronavirus, but at the moment we don't have strong evidence to support that. There is an in vitro, in cultured cells, weak effect and people are doing clinical trials on patients and they're not demonstrating profound differences in clinical outcomes leading us to presume that probably it's just a statistical glitch in the initial observations in patients it's probably not there as a real benefit so it's probably not worth doing this. So why has the UK been bulk buying it? 
Well, the UK bulk buys it anyway because it's used for a range of other reasons, but I suspect they probably had, and, and I'm speculating wildly here, so if anyone knows better, please do write and put me put me straight. But uh, probably they had the order in before they knew what they were bulk buying, uh, in the same way that we bought 16.5 million quid's worth of, of dodgy point-of-care antibody tests that have been repackaged back off to China where they came from, being told they're absolutely useless. I mean, there was a lot of panic buying at the beginning of this, and um, and I suspect there's, there's going to be a lot of returns, if you know what I mean. One question from a listener is, uh, the effect of fever on the virus? He says he's heard that if shingles is caught early enough, artificially elevating temperature can attack it. Would the same apply to COVID-19? Well, the reason we run a temperature is that the immune system, when it responds to an infection, causes inflammation. And part and parcel of inflammation is the release into the bloodstream of immune signalling chemicals, which are called cytokines. They're hormones. And the brain's hypothalamus, which is where your thermostat that sets your metabolic rate and sets all of your temperature regulation, all your settings for temperature regulation, is based... That sees these chemicals and it elevates body temperature. And the reason for this is that parts of the immune system work better at higher temperature and some pathogens, nasties, grow better at lower temperature and grow worse at higher temperature. So it's a way of sort of shifting the balance a bit in your favour away from the pathogen's favour. But to be honest with you, it's a far cry to try and cook this thing into submission. You'll cook your patient before you massively shift that uh, benefit. So temperature may make a small contribution in your body's favour, but uh, too, if it goes too far for too long, of course, it becomes deleterious. So we don't think that, that this is going to be the only answer to this. So sitting in the sauna for a long, long time is not necessarily a good thing. It's probably not going to be a good thing for you um, or the virus. But the, the thing about temperature is relevant when it comes to spread, because we've talked on this program before about why viruses spread less well in summer compared with winter. And uh, mm. one of the reasons is that in the warmer weather, the humidity tends to be higher because warmer air carries more moisture. And if the humidity is higher, when you breathe out and your droplets from your airways go out into the air, they see other stray water molecules in the air around you. And those stray water molecules will flock to droplets because water likes to join up with other water molecules. So they quickly make the droplets get bigger. And if they get bigger, they're heavier. And if they're heavier, they're harder to hold aloft because gravity wins and they're pulled towards the ground. So therefore, the amount of time a virus spends circulating in the air on air currents in a high humidity, warmer environment is lower compared to in colder air in the wintertime. And heat deactivates everything. And there's, there's usually a bit more UV around in summer as well. And some parts of the UV spectrum might have a disabling effect on the virus. So all these things sum and help to shift the balance away from the virus's benefit more towards our favour. We had a question about transmission with schools starting back here in New Zealand. Is there a case, asks Emma, for encouraging or requiring children to wear easily washable clothes rather than blazers and kilts, which can only be dry cleaned? Because as PPE includes a full gown, this suggests there is a risk of transmission via clothing. Well, the UK government, on their advice to the UK population urge washing your clothes a bit more regularly. They do caution that and, and counter that by saying that uh, the, the likelihood in, of the virus loitering on your clothing for very long is not very high. But it is known that viruses can survive on certain surfaces for a few days. And therefore, a more regular wash cycle, if you're encountering viruses more often, would help to mitigate against that. And so I think probably that's a very valid point that's been made there. If, if you have a choice between things you can wash more easily and things that actually are just more for cosmetic benefit at the moment, as we're trying to, to shift the balance in our favour away from the virus's benefit, probably wearing easily washable stuff if you can is fine. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't panic if you can't, because it's going to make at most a small difference, especially given that, I mean, in New Zealand, the amount of virus circulating in society is zilch now. I mean, it's really, really low. In the UK, we've got it right down to very low levels. We know that because we've been screening our healthcare workers uh, in some places, including our hospital. And in April, we picked up about three or four percent of healthcare workers that were carrying, without realising they were carrying coronavirus, 
now we're picking up zero uh, evidence that the the levels have dropped right down because of the lockdown. So it, it's not going to make a massive difference, but every little helps. And if it's something you can easily implement, why not? What's your take on what Sweden's done, Chris? Well, I mean, they're getting they're getting mixed reviews, Sweden, because yeah. in some respects uh, they've been very daring and said, well, we're not going to completely paralyse our country. We are not going to shut up shop. We're going to be cautious, but we're going to weather this storm with the economy intact, we hope. And, and you, on your own programme, you have featured one of their epidemiologists who said, his, in his view, you will end up at the same point at the end of the road uh, in Sweden as other countries. It'll just take other countries longer to get there. And what he means by that is the overall death toll, for example. Looking at the numbers, though, Sweden does have a relatively high mortality rate, suggesting that actually there is more transmission in their country. And I was reading the account of uh, an economist the other day who said that despite the fact that Sweden have managed to maintain a non-lockdown situation, it's probably not going to make a massive difference. They're, they're economically going to be 6-7% uh, economic output down compared to the, 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 where they would expect to be. So um, I guess time is going to tell. We're just going to have to wait and see with this, both in terms of the, the impact on human life and the impact on the economic uh, performance of the country. Well, that's right. I mean, people have pointed out that the cost-benefit analysis of what New Zealand's done um, was not done the cost to the economy versus the benefit to to people's lives. Well, I think you highlighted to somebody, I think it was a, probably one of the most important points I've heard anyone make for a very long time. If we'd spent the amount of money that a country like New Zealand or, you know, the UK is going to spend a third of a trillion, I think. I mean, this, this month just gone, we borrowed £62 billion. Pounds. Uh, unprecedented levels of borrowing. If that were sunk into a African country with our, you know, uh, all the problems that many of these countries have, how many lives could we have saved with a third of a trillion pounds in an African nation compared with uh, in, say, a first world country? And when you start to put it in those terms, it takes on a very different shine, doesn't it? Yeah, we're talking to Toby Ord last week about effective altruism. Uh, just one more question. A couple of weeks ago, um, we were talking about how the nose is a fertile host for the virus to get a start in the body. Is there any point in using those nasal sprays? <laughs> Probably not, because by the time you've lost your sense of smell and taste, uh, it's a bit late because it's in. Um, I was talking this week to no, Tim. Well, we're not to... No, we're not talking about losing our sense of <laughs> okay. smell. Just as a matter of routine using a nasal spray in order to prevent the virus getting a hold? Well, th these things are proposed to work by, in some way, mitigating or preventing these agents being able to gain a toehold in the first place. I don't know if yeah. anyone's done the study yet where they've taken one of those sprays, those defence sprays, to see if it will actually stop it. I suspect it's not going to work. And I suspect this for a number of reasons, because the cells that are targeted by this coronavirus are a bit different than the cells that are often targeted by many of these defence sprays that you spray on your nose and throat. So I suspect it'll bypass that, because remember that some of these infections go straight down into the lungs, and those sprays definitely don't work in that site. So this virus is, is a lot more kind of promiscuous in terms of where it gets into and what it can infect and how it can spread through the body those sprays won't defend you in all those sites. So I, I'm, I'd be slightly worried about putting my, um, all my eggs in that basket. Um, you were talking about the, the group in Perth that you're working with using biomarkers in the blood as a test for COVID, yeah? Mm. Well, somebody has asked whether the research will include selenium levels in the light of a recent study from the University of Surrey supposedly identifying a link between COVID-19 and regional selenium status in China. Any insight yeah. into that? Well, what we're going to do is just go for absolutely everything, not pick on individual things, because the way you've got to think of this is the human body is a biochemical haystack, and in that haystack will be some needles. And we've got to sort out where those needles are and what they mean. And putting this simply, you read thousands of molecules, the signatures of thousands of molecules, and you look at the concentrations and the, the relative levels of all of them. And if you do this enough times on enough people with a particular disease and a particular disease outcome, what you will see eventually is a pattern. 
which is that in some people with a strong predilection for developing a certain disease or a susceptibility to a certain disease, you will find a combination of markers in, or chemicals in the bloodstream or in urine or even in breath, which when measured, if they have that particular characteristic fingerprint, will single out that person as high or low risk. But the hunting is the hard thing. Once you've identified your markers, it's easy to translate this, relatively speaking, into very fast, very agile, very cheap tests, which is where we're going with this. But at this stage, it's a hunting exercise. It's a fishing expedition, wading through hundreds of haystacks to find the needles. So we know what needles to look for, because once we know what we're looking for, then you can make a really fast test that, that should enable us to, to say to a person, you are or you are not at high risk from coronavirus. It's a daring enterprise. It might not work, but um, we, we think we've got good odds of, of finding some markers that will be predictive. I'm assuming that you might have access to an antibody test. If so... Have you had it? <laughs> I, I haven't actually at the moment got access to... Well, I suppose I, I could do because some of the colleagues at my hospital have actually developed their own antibody test. I think they got so frustrated waiting for the government to approve one, they just made their own. Um, but the UK government have now approved um, two, two independent commercial tests from Roche and Abbott, the two companies. But um, I haven't had an antibody test yet. I have screened myself for coronavirus have I got it right now type infection because my wife's a GP and at her surgery they've been very proactive and they decided right every week we're going to screen all of our practice staff doctors the nurses the reception team all the clerical staff even the cleaners to make sure that there's no one knocking around who doesn't know that they've got this because then we can isolate people accordingly and we won't be putting patients at risk and, uh, and so as part and parcel of that it's extended to families because obviously if you've got a family member who's got it they could give it to one of the the doctors and the doctor wouldn't uh, or the nurse wouldn't know that he or she had it um, until they got the symptoms. Forty uh, percent of the time, they wouldn't know that. So, part, as part of that, I've been been screening myself, and I haven't tested positive. But then I wouldn't know what what had happened historically. So, I, I will see if I can get an antibody test at some point, and I'll put myself forward as an experimental volunteer. But the data that's emerging so far is that more than ten percent of the population of London, and probably about five percent of the rest of the UK population, now appear to have had it uh, in antibody terms. So. That means that still there's a good, you know, 60 million plus people who haven't, which is, a, you know, so that's a lot of people. But I was looking at some figures from, again, back to Sweden, where they had this idea. I mean, they're not calling it herd immunity, but that's what they were thinking. And a remarkably small proportion of the Swedish population seems to have the antibodies. Yeah, uh, it was an analysis similar to the one we've actually talked about here on your program that's being carried out where they've taken blood samples representative of the population of Stockholm and they, they published uh, some data showing that uh, just under 8% of that population had had the virus. Interesting, isn't it? Because Sweden has not locked down and they've actually got a lower zero prevalence rate of people with antibodies against this than London. See, I don't which understand is that. No. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I think it's down to population density. It's the fact that uh, Sweden has a relatively small population compared to a centre like the UK. It doesn't have Heathrow Airport with millions of people landing from all over the world, big international hub, and then an incubator called London perched right on top of it. So there's, there's a range of reasons why some countries are going to fare better than others. And, and certainly population density and how people live and how they work, where they work, that makes a very big difference. And, um, and we will have had enormous seeding into the UK very early on in this, probably even December, it was seeding into the UK. And therefore, we were starting lots of little bushfires all over the country. So we had this this wonderful machine gearing this up from the get go. And then when you've got a, a fantastic catalyst like London with people packed into underground trains and things like sardines in the rush hour with you know a third of the Swedish population being moved back and forward under London on a daily basis that's the perfect recipe for brewing this up and that's that's why London took off in such a big way but Stockholm on the other hand less so. Does it amaze you that the UK did not include deaths in aged care homes in their tally? 
Well, they do now, of course, but uh, it doesn't really because everyone's collecting data differently. You could put the same question to Spain and France. You could ask Russia. I'd love, I'd love you to have an interview with Vladimir Putin and ask him how he's managed to pull off 350,000 coronavirus cases and only about 2,500 deaths. Uh, when people have put this to them that uh, there appears to be some disparity here, the answer appears to be that um, they have an exceptionally precise mode of recording a coronavirus death. The point I'm getting at is that everyone's record keeping is different and therefore one has to be very cautious about drawing comparisons between countries and uh, otherwise you're not comparing apples with apples and Chris Whitty who's the UK medical chief medical advisor has been at pains to emphasize that actually what we need to look at is the excess mortality at the end of the year because we know how many people we would expect to lose in a population over a certain period and at a certain time in the year and you can't argue with the fact that someone's passed away. And if you see a, a number which is way in excess of what you would expect on the law of averages to have to have seen uh, in terms of deaths in a year, you know that excess mortality must be attributable to something, and it would you know be very hard to explain that it wasn't it wasn't down to coronavirus. So all countries are going to compute that excess death at the end of their year, and, and it would be very interesting to compare between countries because all of those differences in reporting measures will have will have been dealt with because that data will have translated into excess deaths, regardless of where they occurred. And then we'll see the true signal in all these different countries. Look, we've got a call into Vladimir Putin as we speak. Thank Excellent. you, Excellent. Good luck with that. Don't, uh, don't mention Novichok. <laughs> Dr Chris Smith, a virologist from Cambridge University. Thank you. You're welcome.